Beyond the Fairway presented by Genesis. Will and I, I don't even know where we are on tap this week. Benny Del Negro coming in. He's defending his title this week at the American Century. And Will, NBC's so cheap, I'm actually driving to Tahoe from Phoenix because I don't know where my flight went. I'm just excited to get on the road. Well, well, you know, Doug, I am honored to be with you on this Beyond the Fairway presented by Genesis to go edition. That's to go. That's it. (laughs) I mean, I, actually, I'm in the wilderness. I'm walking to Tahoe, too, you know, but I am walking through this uh, underrated golf tour. Uh, we got, we we're stopping at Wickenburg Ranch this week, and we're having a wonderful time out here. You know, Will, both of us on our way to Tahoe, you doing it in a more unconventional way, hitchhike. I didn't know people still did that, but I hope you got your clubs, which you keep you safe. But um, let's catch up with Vinny Del Negro, man. He's, he's defending. Can he do it? I don't know. We'll talk about it on the back. Let's get to it. Vinny Del Negro. We're going beyond the fairway. Beyond the fairway podcast. Welcome, Zen special guest, Mr. Vinny Del Negro. Vinny, what's up, man? I'm doing great, guys. Good to be with you. You know, Will, it's it's almost that time. You know, Vinny, Vinny, you've played in the American Century. I, I don't even know how many times now. It's been what over eight years. Uh, you got the W no, last this, year. This will be my 21st. See, that's why I was I erred on the side of caution. I was gonna say yeah. twelve, but I had the numbers back. Twenty. Well, I'm a lot older. Even, first. I'm, a lot older than, I'm a lot older than you guys. I was playing when you guys were uh, just running around the gym. <laughs> that that uh, you were playing when I was trying to get to the NBA. There you go. There you, <laughs> yeah. go. There you go. Twenty twenty one years. All right. Well, let's start in there. Uh, how have you seen the championship kind of evolve, Vinny, over over the years? And we're gonna go a few places, but that's, let's start there. Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, it's a it's the Super Bowl of, of celebrity golf. It's Lake Tahoe, Edgewood, NBC, American Century. Um, it's as good as it gets. Um, the the concerts, the festivities, the beauty of the course, the beauty of the lake, um, the celebrities, athletes, entertainers, um, you know, musicians, what have you. It's a big party. And when I started a long time ago in the tournament, I think there was maybe two to 5,000 people that would show up and uh, they're probably going to have 70, 80,000 people this year. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a party. I mean, uh, the boats, the fans, the excitement, um, the superintendent has done a fantastic job with the course. Um, It's difficult. The greens are, have been great the last few years. So it's just, it's just a great week. You know, it's funny, like being, you know, being involved for so many years, Vinny, I'm curious, were you always the serious one or you always say, I'm going to have a good time. However I play, I play because <laughs> I, I, I mean, you were winning last year. You were 75 to one. And, and as far as when it come to the odds last year. Mm-hmm. So what is your take this year? Are you going back? I'm really like, Hey guys, I can't really party. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm defending no, champion no, backseat. I, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'll be honest with you. It is, um, we're, you know, all the athletes, especially we're all competitive junkies. Like we want to compete no matter what it's for, what we're doing. So you always want to play well because you expect to play well. So I think controlling your emotions, understanding it's a 54 hole tournament, you're going to hit some bad shots. You're going to make some bad putts, but just kind of grinding through it, um, controlling your emotions, uh, being able to hit shots under pressure, uh, being smart about where you put the ball on the course. So just kind of uh, understanding how the course and, and what you need to do to fit your game to play the best uh, at times can be difficult, as you guys know, yeah. uh, being okay. athletes and golfers especially. So um, golf can be difficult. It's hard. But I like it because uh, it challenges me, puts me under pressure, which I like. And then you see how you respond. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes you don't hit the shot you want. And then you got to, uh, you know, create something else after that. So um, I don't well, I don't try to overthink it too much. Um, I think we all do at some times. But I think trying to enjoy the moment and trying to enjoy the tournament is obviously an important part of it. Well, I want to kind of talk about pressure. You know, <clears throat> just a few weeks ago, we had Mito Pereira, who... Yeah. Uh, who folded at the, on a 72nd hole. Up, the, I'm sorry. Up. I'm sorry. I've been waiting to get this out. He folded on his 72nd hole of the PGA championship. You know, I want to explain, well, I wonder if you can, you know, describe some of the pressure that you were feeling when you were heading to the playoff last year against John Smoltz. 
you know, I was happy to be in a playoff. I mean, I, you know, you know, Saturday morning, I played really well to kind of put myself in a position. Didn't play very well on the backside Saturday. Got a little tentative. Uh, Sunday, I just kind of stayed in the mix. And then I kind of just kept parring and making a couple birdies. But um, I knew oh, 18. You shot 31 on the front nine, yeah. though, Vin. You shot 31 on the front nine last year. Yeah, I just, you know, I rolled some putts. And I, hit, <laughs> I just, you know, I just, I just made some pars, spot. Will. I just made some pars. You shot <laughs> you know. freaking five under. So that was the key. I mean, for me on Saturday morning, that put me right in the thick of the tournament. I'd been playing. I played well the first day pretty well. But the second day, the front nine kind of, you know, got a little bit of a lead. Then I played 10 on the backside, hit a couple bad shots, made some bogeys. And then on Sunday, I was just like, hey, kind of got off to a mediocre start, just parring and doing some things. John and Jack, you know, made some birdies on the par five, I believe. And um, and then I was able to birdie six. And I think that kind of settled me down, put me right back, I think, in second place. And then I knew it was just kind of hole by hole, running out of holes. And I knew I could birdie some of the holes on the back that had been favorable to me the first couple of days, especially 18. I had birdied both days. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I knew I had a, had a good drive and regulation. I was able to do that. And then in the playoff, I just felt comfortable um, – and it's kind of a, it's a, it's an interesting hole because I have to kind of cut it off the tee because I play lefty, so I have to kind of cut it. So um, yeah. it just worked out, you know. And, and I made a couple putts and uh, was able to secure the victory. But it could have won either way. I mean, Annika, Tony, Steph, uh, Marty Fish, Mark Mulder. There's so many great players. Jack and obviously Smoltz. Yeah. You know, so many good players and so many guys in the mix there. You guys know Stableford is a different thing than stroke play. Yeah, so you can make a couple birdies in a row or make a couple bogeys or 16 guys can eagle, 18 guys can eagle. You can the, the points can flip very quickly. So it's just a matter of, you know, making good shots when you need it to. Now, now are you the first NBA player to win the American Century? I am. Yes. Yes. Con congratulations there, brother. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Will and already was, knew that. He just wanted to give you a prop. Uh, you know, uh, Del Curry who I play with, that's a good friend. They were on the 18th tee, Derek Lowe, Steph Curry, Seth Curry, a bunch of guys that I've been playing there for years, friends, NBC, uh, friends of mine and things. So that was really nice to, to uh, you know, get the basketball guys together and, and kind of celebrate that moment. Now, Vinny, I want to go back quite a ways because you, you got <laughs> drafted in that 88 draft. or that not, Yeah, that 88 draft. And I want to talk a little bit about – one, what do you remember from that draft? Because you had like Danny Manning, Rick Smiths, you had Mitch Richmond in that draft. What do you recall about getting into the league? I mean, back then it was, you know, you just want to get an opportunity. I mean, and, and I knew I was going to get drafted, uh, you know, uh, pretty high, I guess, but not sure uh, if I was going to go to the Celtics or Sacramento and a couple other teams. And, um, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts and my father's, favorite player was Bill Russell and the Kings drafted me and, and uh, Bill was the general manager at the time. So the first NBA call I got was from Bill Russell. That's why so, that's crazy. Uh, so basically I said, hi, thanks so much. You know, you fly out tomorrow, do the press conference and all that. And then my dad just grabbed the phone cause he wanted to talk to Bill. So they <laughs> talked for a while and then <clears throat> and Bill is, is a friend to today. And, um, he could not have been nicer to me in Sacramento. He was a great sounding board for me as a young man trying to make it in the league. And um, not only do obviously respect to him being one of the greatest players, but he was a, a, a great mentor to me early on in my career. Now, you know, Vinny, you played in Sacramento. You played in Milwaukee, Golden State, and Phoenix Suns. All right. Which was the best golf city Easy. in relation? in relation to your schedule, to you being an elite basketball player? Well, the majority of my career, I played in San Antonio with the Spurs. So obviously in Texas with the weather, but you have to understand, I didn't uh, start playing golf till I was, the first time I was on a golf course and played and hit a shot was when I was 27 years old. <laughs> Whoa, wait I a never, minute. Yeah, I never played golf. I, I was, uh, I, I ran track, I played baseball, I played soccer growing up. And then um, when I met my uh, my wife at NC State, her family was big into tennis. So in the summertime, early on in my career, I played a lot of tennis in the summer um, with her and in tournaments and different things with her father and played a ton of tennis. And then my knees started bothering me a little bit just because the wear and tear of the NBA. 
and I knew I had to do something different. So a friend of mine uh, who played golf said, hey, come out on the golf course and just drive the cart. And I do everything in my life right-handed, except I was a switch hitter in baseball. My power was left. He was a lefty golfer. So I was driving the car, and he said, hey, hit a couple balls. So I you know, was on the course with him, hit a couple balls, couldn't hit it. But I enjoyed it. I'm like, man, I might enjoy this a little bit. It's not a team sport. It's individual. It's on me. You know, I'm a grinder. I'm a competitor. Um, I can, you know, save my body a little bit. So I went in the next day, and I called Ping, and they sent me a set of irons. And um, – I started kind of getting off my knees a little bit in the summer. I started hitting a bunch of balls. I really haven't taken many lessons in my life. I'm a field guy. So uh, you sound like Will, tennis field I, player. This yeah, is... so obviously I've taken a few, and I've been very fortunate to play with a lot of great pros and a, a lot of great players that have helped me. But, um, you know, I'm one of those guys where if I, I see you do it, I'm going to try to emulate it my way to kind of make it work for me. Um so I don't try to get too technical. I, I try to kind of, you know, I'm a feel guy. That's how I played. You know what I mean? Uh, I think the more you think, the, the slower your feet get in basketball. You have It's a reaction sport. And I think in golf, your body has to react. You know, whether you want to hit it high, low, draw it, cut it, whatever you want to do, depending on the condition. Balls. Bars. That's what I'm but, see, but you know, see, I Vinny, I think, I think you're my golf soul brother, <laughs> Mr. Del, Del Negro. Because, uh, uh, I'm I'm all about being a field player. I, I I don't I'm not big on you know being technical, but I gotta know what was the shot that brought you back. I think there's always one shot around. I mean, there's just that one shot where you hit it and you're like, that's how you're supposed to hit a golf ball. Like you know, like it's it doesn't happen. Yeah, it's just it's the feel of the contact, the turn, the finish, the balance. Um, and I think the good thing for me is. Um, I know enough about golf to understand when I'm doing it right and when I'm not, but I don't know enough technically, which I think is a good thing. So I, think I it's don't great overthink great. it sometimes. I'm like, that just didn't feel right. I didn't turn my balance. So there's a few like trigger points for me, but I don't try to overanalyze it too much because I'm not knowledge enough in that. Where if you ask me questions about basketball, I can break it down to the nth degree. Yeah. Where in golf, I really don't want to do that, and I'm not knowledgeable enough to do it. So it's kind of blissful though, too. You know what I mean? When you don't know, it's like, all right, I'll I'll do better next time. I don't care if my wrist is. In or I'll ask, or... you know, I'll ask a pro. You know, I'll ask whoever. You know, whoever I'm playing with, or at Whisper Rock, or a teacher, or a really good player that I respect, or someone that knows I knows the swing or knows my game a little bit, someone that kind of has a lot more knowledge about that than I do. Can you well, teach Can you teach Doug how to shoot a basketball? Man, I got – Will sleeps on me. First of all, Will, before you even answer that, Vinny, there's like, no we, way we you can, can play basketball. Look at you. So what Will fails to realize, <laughs> Vinny, is I was actually – your dad and I have something in common. We were both part of the men's basketball team at the University of Kentucky. I'm from Lexington area, Kentucky. Wow. I was a, I was a manager. Up. Hold on. I was a, what? You you can't just hit him with you were part of the men's basketball team. I was part. I was a manager. Explain how you was a part of it, Doug. I was a manager for the men's basketball <laughs> okay. team in 05. Like were you Tubby, really? Yeah, Tubby Smith is like like my best friend's dad. So yeah. you know, we growing up, Brian went to Lexington Catholic. I went to Lexington Christian. And, yeah. and Tubby, you know, was was part, part was the man. man. Part of so, men's basketball team. So it was, was like, part of men's basketball team. It was, but about. just you just like you just came out wrong with it. I it's... I was a part of the men's program. I got the thing on the wall. I got pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, just so you know the history there, my dad played for Adolph Rupp in Kentucky. Yeah. I, so I went to two summer camps at Kentucky uh, for basketball camp when I was a, real young because the assistant coach for Joe B. Hall was a guy named Dick Parsons, mm -hmm. and Dick was my father's roommate at Kentucky. So I went there for a couple of years. I was actually going to go to Kentucky. I was scheduled to go there, and then um, Coach Valvano uh, came I was, and I, you knew I was, You knew I was heading there. That's where I was heading. Friends, and the, re the rest was history. Well, that's, that's one of the things I, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So I grew up around, like, Coach Patino, Sure. Uh, and, and, and and Tubby Smith and, and all these guys, Joby Hall and my dad were really close. But yep. one thing, one thing I, I have to ask, like, so we're talking about Jimmy V, Jim Valvano. He's one of the, one of the best orators I think in basketball history, in my opinion. One of the biggest hearts. When you play for a guy like that, and there's so many lessons like that you can learn from from a Jimmy V. What 
what did you take from the basketball court to golf that you learned through Jimmy V? In life. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot. Of I know things. it's it's a Larry loaded question, but I mean, there's got to be a couple things. I could spend hours on the stories with Coach Valvano and oh. how he was tough on me and but made me better and would yell at me and then hug me and we'd go eat or go to his office and he'd smoke a cigar and eat popcorn and we'd play darts or when I had a charity function he flew up and spoke at it for me or I mean there's a million things uh, he'd recite poetry to the team. He was an incredible speaker, incredible motivator. I think what, what, what goes unmissed about Coach Favano, how great of a coach he was in terms of switching defenses. You know, when I was at NC State, we had one of the, the first, second, third recruiting classes in the country because everyone wanted to be there. Everyone wanted to be in the ACC and play for him and compete against North Carolina and things. So um, there's a million stories. But obviously, I you know, um, the V Foundation for Cancer Research is kind of his, well, a part of his legacy. And I know you guys have all seen the speech, but I live that in my recruiting process, playing for from four years, the meetings, the individual talks. Um, but at the end of the day, I grew up like that. I grew mm -hmm. up in an Italian family and my dad was tough on me. And that's how Coach Favano was. It was when they were yelling at you, they were yelling at you because they wanted to make you better. And they saw the talent and the, you know, the, the, the opportunities that could be presented to you if you worked at it. So some guys could take it, some guys couldn't, but I grew up like that. So I think from Coach Valvano's aspect, it's, you know, the never give up thing, but really it's having a strong mind. It's enjoying the day. Mm. It's being loyal. It's being, you know, competitive. It's wanting to be the best. Um, there, there's a ton of things, but I think uh, the biggest, the biggest probably thing is having the mindset and the preparation to be successful. You have to put the work in. It's not just going to happen. Yep. You have to go practice. You have to prepare. And you have to be able to understand it's not always going to go perfect, but your chances are much better if you prepare the right way. And if they don't go as, as well, keep practicing. Believe in yourself. Keep your confidence. And eventually, you're going to be able to cross the finish line. You know, and I, and I want to talk about, you know, crossing the finish line. You're in, in 1988, uh, your senior year, you made first team AC, all ACC. And, you know, I want to know, like, you know, coming from playing under the legendary coach, um, Jimmy V, I, I had to ask you, is that the system you're in that got you to, you know, to, to a high accolade like there? Is that just pure talent? I was just that good. Now, how much is it? What's the ratio between great system versus I'm the greatest player that that that, you know, just haven't been discovered yet? I think there's a balance to it. I, I think uh, every situation is different. Um, you know, I had, I had worked my way up from my freshman year not playing very much to my sophomore year not playing much to my junior really kind of taking off and kind of paying my dues and, you know, graduating in four years, going to summer school, playing in summer leagues, getting in the weight room, running on the track, doing all my drills, working every day. And then when it was my time to, to perform, I was ready for it. So it was a preparation thing. And that's not to say it wasn't difficult early on, but I think the difficulty early on made the rest of it even more special. And you have to have a strong mind. You have to, you know, the perseverance part of it. Um, they have to fight through it. And some guys can do it. And, and some guys uh, don't have that mental approach or injuries take toll of them or their preparation doesn't or their mindset doesn't. So I think it, it's a culmination of all those things um, that get you there. And then once you're there, you're never really there. You're always working to perform and gaining knowledge and getting better every day. And you know there's another door to knock down or another goal to set for yourself. And that's what you have to continue to do to last as long as you can. Because going from high school to major college is one thing. And then going from major college to the NBA and playing and succeeding and playing a long time is a whole nother level. So you're always preparing. You're always getting better. You're always trying to gain knowledge uh, knowledge is power. So being able to gain that knowledge, incorporate it in your game, being around the right people that are preparing the right way, putting the work in, um, you know, that that's the battle of all of it. And the well, mindset. Well, you, you talk about the preparation and the battle and getting ready. Uh, 
tell me how you're doing it this year. Last year, getting ready for the American Century, I'm sure you were kind of a little bit more free and just, you know, going through your motions. Now you're coming back as a defending champion. Does anything change as it relates to your preparation, how you're managing your time, or is it just to hell with it? Let's go play. Uh, no, I mean, you know, you, you prepare. I mean, um, um, right after American Century, I went in and I had three tears in my labrum and some shreds in there and some tears in my shoulder. So I had to take about four or five months off and rehab and I didn't have surgery. And luckily I had some shots and some things that my therapist Keith Coker did for me. And, and it was fantastic. And I'm feeling a lot better. Started playing golf for the last maybe month and a half. Went over, played in a tournament in California. I came back a couple of days later. I got bronchitis and COVID. So I'm Damn. just getting over mm. that. So I really have not played a lot of golf, but the next three weeks, I'm starting to feel better, getting my energy back. And so for the next three weeks, four weeks before the tournament, I'm going to start chipping, putting, hitting balls, playing and preparing and just being smart on my preparation. I'll get up to Tahoe. I'll play a you know couple practice rounds probably, and then we'll tee it up and we'll go from there. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the pressure is part of it. That's I think that's the fun part of it. You know what I mean? I mean, we can go out I mean, we can go play golf and have fun and, you know, you know, go have lunch and whatever. But when you're under the gun and yeah. you got, you got to post a score. I love yeah. It's hard and it's stressful, whatever. But for me, that's what, man, I'm a man. That's what I'm alive. That's what I, that's what I want. So I want the last second shot. I want to, I want to drop the last gate, you know, the last, you know, second play. That's oh, what man. I want. You know what I mean? I mean, I like that. Well, it's I, not always good. I'm not always going to make it, but I'd rather take it because I have confidence I can pull it off. And if I do great, and if I don't, I'm going to go have lunch or dinner with my wife and friends, and shooters I'm going to prepare well. for the next day, and I'm going to go after it again. And how it comes out, it comes out. That's, well, speaking, that's that shooter's speak, mentality. I love well, that. Well, speaking of somebody who we don't want to have last shot, I am completely going off left center field. I don't know if this will just <laughs> count to bass. That didn't want to work. That, we gotta that one. But I got to know, I, I got to know, how was Dennis Rodman in the San Antonio years? Can you, can you share a story uh, oh. about Dennis Rodman real quick? Cause we know him Chicago, we know Detroit, but you don't hear too many San Antonio Dennis Rodman stories. Cause I mean, well, I'll, um, we know Dennis is, uh, uh, eccentric, uh, eccentric, eccentric, eccentric. Yes, good word. Uh, eccentric, different. Goes about his business a different way. Um, I got along tremendously with Dennis. We sat in next to each other on the plane. Um, you know, we ran out of pills on the plane because every plane ride, his hair color was different, and the dye would get on the pill, so they'd have to throw <laughs> pillow. That's so Jericho no, juice in the hood. Uh, Reason, we had to go buy all new pills. We had no pills. So, but uh, I will say this. The, the, the interesting thing about Dennis is if you look at the our record, the two years we played, myself, Sean Elliott, and Avery Johnson, and I would think David Robinson because he was MVP that one of the years, mm -hmm. we probably all had statistically our best careers when we played with Dennis. Really? And the reason is is because – Dennis, you know, Dennis would get a rebound and he would have a layup and he wouldn't shoot it. He'd throw it out to me and I would say, Dennis, make the layup, shoot the layup. It's, you know, he goes, Vinny, they pay me to rebound. They pay you to shoot. That's it. Oh. And I said, perfect. Just keep throwing <laughs> me the ball. I have no problem shooting. So, and Sean had no problem shooting. And Avery had no problem getting assists and attacking the basket. And David had no problem scoring and doing his thing because he was the superstar on the team. So, you can say what you want about Dennis. He was a unique, unique individual, tremendous defender, agitated everybody. But when the ball was thrown up, uh, he competed at an incredibly high level. And he's one of my favorite teammates because I knew when I went in to play a game, no matter what, I knew he was going to give me everything, battle, and he was going to give us the best chance to win. Um, and we did at a high level. Uh, we weren't able to get to the finals that year. Um, but at the end of the day, we were in a position that we probably might not have been in other without Dennis. You talk about Spurs and rebounding and guys posting up. Would you kind of equate your game to like Roger Mason, uh, you know, a guy that was just a spot up kind of three point shooter? You know, we're all different. The Spurs have had so many great players throughout the years. Like that, Will. Look at Will. You know, See, um, I don't know basketball, Will. You know, I, I played point, but I was really a shooter, pen, you know, pick and roll guy, mm. you know. 
you know, they, you know, we knew that half the arena was going to guard David Robinson. So you better put some shooters around them. So I was fortunate to play with David for a lot of years. And then Tim Duncan, his rookie year. Um, so, uh, you know, playing in that atmosphere with the great coaches, coach Popovich, all the great high character guys, not only the talent, uh, just tremendous. I talked to Avery Johnson the other day. I talked to David Robinson. I see, you know, we're, you know, we, we still talk, I mean, just great guys, high character, great players. Um, the Spurs have done a fantastic job for so many years, bringing in really not only great players, but guys that get along, understand their job, build a system. And, you know, there's no question, David Robinson and Tim Duncan are, are the reason, obviously, everyone else has been able to have as successful careers as they've had. Hey, Vinny, I am cracking up this man through the right, right. <laughs> hey, no, but he made a point. He so did. He made a point that he did. Robin was supposed to rebound. But he Vinny's said supposed to knock it down. That was good. But that was yeah, Roger you know, Mason. No, that was start. Roger Mason. I just, I just yeah, try, I know you try to act like I don't know where you got that one. That's like me saying, so, "Hey, did you did you play with Chris Corciani and Roddy Monroe?" Yeah. But v my thing, you know, people like I'm an, you know, like I'm the older uh, Ginobili. Not as you are. You are the first Ginobili. I said that. the first. No, he's the first Del Negro. Oh, first Del probably? Negro. Second. You know I mean? Like yeah. so, like you know, then Ginobili came in and we kind of you know handled the ball. He was obviously a much better player and, and, and a halt to me, Tony Parker and Ginobili Hall of Fame guys. But, um, you know, but th there's so many guys. And I was just blessed to play there and learn so much. Um, it helped me not only in my playing career throughout, but obviously in coaching when I was coaching and um, just just a great situation. You talk about Hall of Fame guys. Now, Vinny, you play it over at Whisper Rock. Now, when you walk through Whisper Rock and you pass the shop and you get one of the best practice facilities in the country, there's no shortage of who's who's out there. Who do you yeah. play with when you go out and play play some G? Because there's hundreds oh, you, of guys play, you can play with. Like you said, it's just uh, Whisper Rock is a special place. It's uh, the hang. It's the atmosphere, the practice facilities. There's so many pros out there. Um, you know, last week I snuck out and, and uh, played nine holes with Kevin Shulman. Uh, you know, when I was there, John Rahm and Colt and a few other buddies were playing with, you know, with John Rahm and some other guys. Uh, uh, Kevin Chappell, Ches Reeve, Paul Casey. Uh, I mean, the list is just, it's nonstop. So, but it's not about, you know, it's, it's, it's about enjoying it, the game of golf, the hang. Um, everyone is just uh, loves the game, wants to compete no matter what it is. Um, and but there's so many, you know. The other day I played with Bob Tway, and uh, you know Hayden Wood and Willie, with just a bunch of guys and great players, great guys. Uh, you know, being able to play with those guys and watching them helps me. You know what I mean? How they hit shots, why they hit a shot, where they hit it. You know, certain guys just try to bomb it. Certain guys have to dissect the course. So all those things are important. If you really want to shoot a good score, you have to understand how those things can fit into your game. You, you said Colt. Is that Colt Nose or Colt Ford? <laughs> Colt Nose. Okay, all right. All right. Slightly, and, slightly and larger one. The slightly yeah. larger guy. Slightly. <laughs> but, you know, Colt, I play with Colt. Colt can hit it, man. I mean, from 150 in. Yeah, he's I dead. Mean, he, he's tough. But, you know, Sleaze is great. I mean, there's so many guys. You know them all. I mean, yeah. there's so many guys out there, and we have a great time. I love it. Well, big shouts out to the Trius family and David yeah. Lord, just the homie, uh, and all the folks over at Whisper Rock, Bobby Offenbacker, everybody, man. We love you all out there. When I do get to play, Benny, you know, I'm not a member, so I got I wait on that call. Uh, I didn't know you were in Phoenix. Now you know where, now you just call me. All right, done. Problem solved. All right, Vinny, we let everybody out of here the same way. We call it Rap Foursome right here on Beyond the Fairway podcast presented by Genesis. You're going to go play golf with four rappers. You're playing a five ball. They don't have to be alive, dead or alive. They don't have to play golf. If they do, that's cool. But my question is, is who are you pulling up to the golf course with? Four rappers. Rappers? Rappers, yeah. See? Um, That'll be easy, Vinny. We, we, we should have prepped. Jay-Z. Nope, didn't have to prep Jay Z, nice. Uh, Perfect. Do they have to be alive? Nope, no, dead or alive. Dead or alive. Uh, Just need four. That's hard for me. I would say Jay Z, Biggie, Tupac. Um, another rapper. That's a hard one for me. Give me some examples. Uh, uh, you got Drake. You got J Cole. You got Kendrick Lamar. You got. M &M. I said Drake. I would like Drake because he's a big basketball fan. I've never okay. met Drake. So he I would is. Probably... We'll, we'll Drake. throw Drake in there. He, okay. he act like he's a hooper. 
I mean, I see him on his, his Instagram. But he, like you know, I, I love that he loves the game. He goes That's to the true. game. He's here and he's into it. I mean, I like that. I mean, enjoy the game. I mean, you know, um, so many great athletes, you know, we're watching the finals now. Uh, but just, you know, you know, I love that he's a he's a he's a real fan. He's there. Yeah. He's here. And he's he's into yeah. it. He he yeah. wants Toronto to do well. Yeah. So I respect that. Yeah, Jay Z. Jay Z. was uh, courtside game five at the uh, finals. I saw so, him. Yeah, absolutely. Jay Z and E Forty, both of them out there. But, but I uh, played with so many great golfers. I mean, I I love you know I've, I've had a lot of great entertainers, golfers, people, but. Um, you know, I played 18 holes years ago with Arnold Palmer. That was a great golf day for me. I mean, to play with Arnold and the King and enjoy the day with him in a tournament. We were, uh, it, w- it was me, him, and George Carl in a PGA Tour NBA thing. And to play with Mr. Palmer, the King, and, you know, that was, I have it in my office, things he signed for me. To, to play with Arnold Palmer, I don't know what, if it gets better than that. What was your one takeaway from playing with Arnold Palmer? And we'll let you go. He played the first three holes well, the first thing is we teed off first. It was on the golf channel, and I actually birdied the first hole, and I hit. I just hit in like a 20-foot putt. I was lucky. He hit it to like 10 feet, made it, and he put his arm around me, and he said, I think we're going to win the tournament. And then every hole we walked, and we had stories, and he was a big NBA fan, and that's when Michael was in his heyday, and we talked about Michael a little bit and other golfers and players. And the first three holes, he – uh, hit a different driver. He took plastic off the driver because he <laughs> drivers in his bar. That's how Will plays. Every time I you know, see he him, he's pulling the plastic, plastic off. And I was like, he had like all these drives. He, this was his third time. At the time, he was going through chemotherapy. He flew his plane and helicopter in the driver range. He shook everybody's hand on the golf course. There's probably 5,000 people there watching him. And then hit a few balls. He went out. He shot even par from the back tees. It was amazing. And then um, afterwards, we took pictures. And a week later, he signed some things, and they sent me a, a big frame thing with us, and it's in my office. And awesome. just not could not have been a nicer man and what he did for the game. He was – there was a caddy. Fluff was caddying, and then we had another caddy. I'll tell you a quick story. Is almost every hole, Mr. Palmer would ask the caddy, what kind of shot do you want me to hit? Oh, and, oh, you know, wow. raw, fade, whatever. And on number 18, he was hitting shots, and – he was telling me, you know, I really like to move the ball here, I like to draw it. And he hit the shot with his with a new driver, and he hit it to him, and he handed the club to the kid in front of everybody. And the kid was probably like 15 years old or something, and kind of his eyes were big. And he said to the kid, I hit that shot for you. And I remember looking at the kid and the pride and the joy that was in that kid's face. I'll never forget it. It was just the impact that he had the whole day, but in those moments when he knew how influential he was and the impact he had on people, it really was just a special moment, a special day. Beyond the Fairway is presented by Genesis Motor America and the first ever GV70. Dynamic design and exhilarating performance. Make the game your own. Doug, I have to say, I'm really excited because I think we're the first time that we have a chance that we see we may see a back-to-back winner in the uh, American century this, this year. You know, Vinny DeNegro had the, I mean, he had a heartbreaking performance at the end, clutch beating John Smoltz in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a playoff. And I, uh, I'm excited, man. I have to say I'm excited for this year. Man, back to back though, look, I just, I just caught wind via Instagram that yo boy, Stephen Curry, flew in Alex Riggs from all the way from Dubai just to get a golf lesson. So I don't know if I can go against Steph. He's Steph Curry is pulling out all the stops, Will. To, to, he won a championship. Now he wants another one. I know we're talking about Del Negro coming out of here, but I don't know if Vinny can hang with Steph though this year as we get into the American Century. I, I mean, I got I'm a little I'm a little saucy. You know, I thought I was Steph's coach. Next thing you know, I find out, you know, you know, Alex is coming. But Alex is a great coach, great swing coach. I listen to all of his uh, Instagram. <laughs> You know lessons. So I mean, if I had to get the boot because of him, I'll accept that. But uh, I still don't know if he's gonna win, though. I mean, it's a free trip for Alex, but he ain't winning. He ain't winning the, the American Century. I love him, but you know who might win the American Century? Who? You know who's on the bag? For who? I'm going to be on the bag for Seth Curry, and we're gonna win the American Century. Man, you got your damn mind. Hey, y'all heard it here first. <laughs>
Seth golfing ass Curry going to win the American century. I don't know, Will. Look, the way gas prices is, I don't know if I can make it past uh, uh, Las Vegas on, on my route right now. But uh, pray for me to get there. I'll see you. I think I think they're gonna send the plane for you. You got you get that special treatment. And yeah. hey, I'll say this: you talking smack about Steph. Don't forget whose name is on your hat right now. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> that is true. Uh, just kidding, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll holler at y'all, man. Thanks for always rocking with us. Beyond the Fairway, presented by Genesis. Hey, American Century Week. We're gonna have crazy content coming. Be sure to tune in to all the Golf Channel stuff, all the NBC stuff, as well as our socials. We're going to be everywhere, so you'll probably get sick of us both. So, sorry now. <laughs>